Hello, everyone. Yet once again, it's another day of fresh grace and mercy. This is the Guilt, Grace, Gratitude podcast, where we bridge the gap to Reformed Christian theology for your listening pleasure. And today we're doing a season four episode. We're having Dr. Irwin Ince back on our show. We're really excited about this conversation with him. It's going to be on parachurch ministries, and uh, it's on our Reformed Church seasonal episodes. So season four, Reformed Church, Parachurch Ministries. If you go to our show notes, there's going to be some information. You're going to uh, learn a little bit more about Dr. Ince. Um, you're going to find a local Reformed Church finder. So you can type in your zip code and find the different uh, Reformed Church denominations near you. You can find out information on how to contact us directly for any questions and comments. Um, our email is guiltgracepod at gmail.com. We are on we are active on Twitter and Instagram, and you can see these videos even as I speak on YouTube. So uh, good stuff there. You can also uh, find ways to contact Peter directly. He has his own church in Orange County, uh, Santa Ana Reformed. You can find out information about that. And uh, also bridge builders. That's the uh, term we have for our um, people that financially donate to us. So find out more information about that, how to become a bridge builder, help us bridge that gap and keep our bridge maintained. Um, so yeah, we'll jump into this episode and welcome back, Dr. Irwin Ince. We're so excited. Yeah. Yeah. Good to be with you brothers again. It's yes. Been a, it's been a while. I think the first one was was it in the middle of the pandemic, the first conversation? Some, yeah, something like Good that. Question. Was like, I, yeah. I, all of our episodes now like blend into each other because we've done yeah. it. So, so it was like March or April of last year. Yeah, it was somewhere, okay. somewhere yeah. kind of in the middle of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I, so we, uh, if you guys look on Dr. Dr. Ince's Twitter, if you guys, if you guys know anything about him, if you guys saw him last time, he had a, he had a job change since, since mm-hmm. last time we had him on. So he's now the uh, coordinator of the PCA MNA, which is the Mission to North America, and we'll, we'll describe, Dr. Ince describe what he does and what that is, and he's also a, an adjunct professor of Reformed Theological Seminary, uh, and he's going to be teaching a course in Dallas this summer, but yeah, it's super, super exciting to have you on, and um, yeah, how, how's it been going? How, how's life? How's the new job? How's, how's all this stuff going? It's, uh, it's pretty intense. It's pretty intense without question. Um, you know, this uh, move into the coordinator role for Mission to North America, I'm, I think I'm around month, uh, month nine, uh, a year ago at this time, I was in the interviewing candidating mm-hmm. process uh, for the role. And it is, um, it's significant to, uh, to try to lead this, uh, this organization that seeks to serve uh, our denomination for uh, for greater kingdom advancement in the United States and Canada. So, yes, I'm still, you know, trying to get my head around all of it, mm-hmm. <laughs> engage it well. Um, and uh, as a, uh, you know, uh, the, my father's favorite pro- poem was uh, the poem "If" by Rudyard Kipling, mm-hmm. which is about manhood. And there's this line in one stanza: "It's." If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, <laughs> if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you and make allowance for their doubting too, <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm like, yeah, I'm trying to keep my head, <laughs> trying yeah. to trust myself, yep. trying to, you know, yeah. Anyway, love it. There's a, a little icebreaker question as well, kind of off topic, but I know you appreciate, and I showed you before recording. Yeah. You appreciate kettlebells. Love it. Heavy, the heavy ke- it like, is that a heavy kettlebell? Oh. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah, this, this is how pounds, right? I'm impressing, right I'm impressing the kettlebell guy here with one arm <laughs> lifting you guys on YouTube. Um, it's one of my lighter ones, but it just looks heavy, but, uh, you should have just went with like, Oh, that's my, uh, one of my heavier ones. Yeah. 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 Sure. Why not? <laughs> tell, tell us about the heavy kettlebell club. Did I say that right? The, uh, swing heavy kettlebell club. Is actually, so it's actually just a moniker. There's a guy in New York, who makes um, kettlebell related t-shirts, paraphernalia, he's really into kettlebells. And so it's not an official club. Okay. It's just, you know, people who are into kettlebell training uh, pretty heavily will, uh, will, will grab, you know, you'll see his shirts all over the place. You'll see mm. his, uh, 
is uh, in one of the shirts is Swing Heavy Kettlebell Club, you know, and so I've got a little, I got a little uh, flag or yeah. banner in my mm -hmm. home gym mm -hmm. on the wall. That's <laughs> right. I've got t-shirts that say Swing Heavy Kettlebell Club, and so mm. uh, it's something I got into. I've always, I've been familiar with kettlebells mostly yeah. through CrossFit since 2010, mm -hmm. but when the pandemic hit. And I started training pretty exclusively at home. I already had three kettlebells. And so I could, that's what kind of shifted my emphasis towards a more kettlebell biased training. So anyway. Hmm, what's, right. the, what's the heaviest kettlebell you've swung? Um, the heaviest one I've swung is my heaviest bell, which is a 56 kilogram bell. Okay. Uh, which like, is what, 123, 123, 123 yeah. pounds. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And if you guys follow... Dr. Ince on Twitter, I believe it's Twitter. I just, I see your, your, yeah, your workouts every now and then. I'm like, man, that guy. They're mostly, I put them mostly on Instagram. I use Instagram. Oh, Instagram. For my, That's right. I call most of my faith, family, and fitness posts are on Instagram. That's right. It's Instagram. I see it. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're right. Yeah. Good stuff. Heck, heck yeah. <clears throat> well, cool. Maybe. So those, those who may not know you, and I, I don't think we talked about this that much on our last episode, which was about a year ago, sometime in like May, I think it came out last year. But if you can kind of describe who you are, your background, sure. um, I know you had a kind of a life before full-time ministry and what yeah. ministry life has looked like. Yes, um, I, I am a native New Yorker, born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. Both my wife and I from Brooklyn, uh, got married mm -hmm. there 30 years ago, matter of fact, 1992. Nice. And, um, uh, was an electrical engineering major in college. So I, my first uh, profession or vocation was as a systems engineer for Motorola, um, hmm. designing two-way radio communication systems for public safety, state and local government customers uh, in the mid-Atlantic area. So moved from New York to the DC area in 1995 for hmm. work and uh, did that full-time for 11 years I would always y'all remember the sh tv show cops oh yeah um oh, yeah. you know anytime I watch cops I'm looking and say okay what kind of radio are <laughs> yeah. looking at their lapel mic does it say Motorola I'm like okay that's that's my stuff that that's what I did I designed systems huh. for police fire and rescue huh. um public safety uh, applications yeah. and so loved that work um in the middle of that work that profession my my goal was to do that for the entirety of my career, hmm. I wanted to become a corporate VP at Motorola eventually. Hmm. And uh, the Lord had different designs. Uh, first called me to himself. Hmm. Uh, in that year, we moved in 1995. Uh, I grew up in the church, but had rejected the Christian faith hmm. during my teen years. I uh, had become very much immersed in a black nationalistic worldview hmm. in the middle to late 1980s. Um, and so came to faith uh, at, a, um, at a church, uh, a Baptist church, African-American Baptist church here in Washington, D.C. Mm. My wife and I began attending when we moved. And that kind of set me on this trajectory, uh, certainly of following the Lord, but then this sense of calling to ministry that was... Um, that was pretty, um, <laughs> I don't want to traumatic sounds too, you know, <laughs> intense, but it was, it really had a deep impact. I did not want to be a pastor hmm. at all. I was not, there was nowhere in my career goals. And um, I had become, so I had become exposed to reform theology through Christian radio, uh, <laughs> Stumbled across the Renewing Your Mind broadcast oh, yeah. by Ligonier oh, yeah. Ministry and heard R.C. Sproul. Yep. This is around 1996. Okay. And uh, they had radio back then. Yeah, that's why they had radio, right? <laughs> Didn't su subscribe to the Tape of the Month Club. Okay. <laughs> yes. <Right>. Yeah. <laughs> so cassette tapes, right? Eventually yeah. became CDs, right? right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Some of our listeners are like, "What are tapes? What are tapes? Tape? <laughs> yeah." <laughs> right. Um, but that was, and so, so I become reformed in my theological outlook, uh, but still remained at uh, this traditional African-American Baptist church mm -hmm. until 
I started having designs on ministry and uh, began attending Reform Theological Seminary, the DC campus in the fall of 2000. Hmm. And that was kind of my trajectory into the PCA, which I uh, joined in 2002 officially hmm. at a church, PCA church plant outside of Washington, DC, uh, and have now been 20 years in the denomination. Praise awesome. God. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. I love, yeah, I love hearing the background from these guests. And yeah, it's, I think people, people hear these names, either Ints or any, anybody else. And like, oh, they've always been a minister. They've always mm -hmm. been, they've always been like this, but it's, yeah, we all come from different backgrounds, whatever it may be, but it's, it's awesome to hear um, what, what, what you've been doing. <clears throat> so you, you moved recently from full-time pastoral ministry, also kind of leading a parachurch or a parachurch ministry as well to coordinator of the PCA MNA. And we've mm -hmm. talked about this a little bit, yeah. Um, but can you describe what that is, what the MNA is, how, how that, what's the relationship with PCA, yeah. uh, what that transition is like, and, and how you view kind of in general parachurch mm -hmm. ministry? Because in a sense, you lead one, even though it's part of the denomination, but it's not part of the, the church proper. So maybe if you can describe what it is and how it relates to some of these things. Yes. Well, let me, let me, let me start at the end here, your last point. Yeah. Talk about parachurch ministries, because in a sense, before being coordinator, I... I directed and developed the Institute for Cross-Cultural Mission, yeah. which was a ministry of Grace DC, a PCA church here in DC yeah. that I would staff at. And when I think about parachurch, because it you know, can be confusing and some people have negative yeah. perspectives of parachurch, others are fine with it or don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I use you know, my, my nerdiness, uh, you know, the, <laughs> the Greek, preposition para right uh -huh. which, which means essentially beside right so you think about parachurch ministry is coming be coming beside the church serving the church coming alongside the church to help the church in its in its in its work and in its mission right so it's not technically something that i consider to be completely separate from the church mm -hmm. even though Many parachurch ministries are not affiliated officially with a church, but Westminster Theological Seminary, Reformed Theological Seminary, um, right? These, these are technically parachurch ministries. They yeah. serve the interests and help the church, but they are not, they don't belong, quote unquote, to the church mm -hmm. formally, mm -hmm. right? So anytime you've got a Christian ministry that is seeking to, to come alongside, to help the church, right, uh, in its in its mission and work, it's a parachurch uh, organization. Now, Mission to North America is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. I'm considered parachurch, but it, you know, PCA was 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 founded in 1973, and in our uh, Book of Church Order and our Rules of Assembly operation for our General Assembly, which represents this whole denomination, we established permanent committees and agencies. And among those permanent committees and agencies, one of them is Mission to North America. And so Mission to North America um, is the PCA's domestic missions arm, okay. right? So the, the technical language <laughs> in our rules of assembly operation say that the affairs of the church involved in its extension in the United States and Canada are assigned to the Committee on Mission to North America. So our responsibility is to help the PCA, our churches in the United States and Canada, in anything that is related to the extension of God's kingdom in, through our churches in the US and Canada. So that includes church planting, that includes outreach ministries, helping our churches do mis local mission. Uh, it includes figuring out what are the trends for effective gospel outreach and evangelism, right, in the United States and Canada. So these are things that, um, that you could say no one single congregation can really do all of that well yeah. and effectively. And every, every church 
or every congregation is concerned with things like evangelism, mm -hmm. is concerned with things like mercy ministry and, um, and, and, and loving neighbors um, in Jesus' name, right? Uh, every church has those kinds of things, so whether it be diaconal type of concerns, evangelistic type of concerns, planting new congregations, right? But, mm -hmm. but most churches don't have the resources to really be comprehensive in, in any of those things. So the PCA established a, a, an organization like Mission to North America to help our churches in those ways, mm -hmm. to be a resource for the cultivating of faithful kingdom mission and advancement in the US and Canada. Yeah, and that's a, that's a great explanation and background of why parachurch ministries exist. And one of my next question was, and you pretty much answered it, but maybe uh, we could re-ask it too, but like specifically kind of a, more, a definition of what is a parachurch organization? Maybe what, historically, why did they start? What, what were they, um, what, was the, what was the need that made yeah. them what does it do creative. different than the church? Like, why, like, why do you need a parachurch church if you already have the church? Yeah, that's great, great question. And, um, and I don't, you know, I don't, I don't have the definitive history sure. <laughs> of parachurch organizations, but it is important to, to know and see again, that, that the, the purpose of a parachurch organization is to serve, in my estimation, the, the, the effective ones or the ones that um, have the right kinds of outlooks, uh, outlook is to serve the church. Mm -hmm. the, the Christ promised, I will build my church mm -hmm. <laughs> and the gates of hell shall not prevail against mm -hmm. it. So, so a parachurch organization should not exist for the sake of itself. It should exist for the sake of serving the interests of the church and helping the church be faithful to its mission and calling, right? Again, to come alongside. And so, so again, individual congregations, so denominations even, have all whether, you know, there's an equivalent, um, to mission to North America mm -hmm. in the Southern Baptist Convention. Mm -hmm. This may be more focused on church planting exclusively, but denominations have said we need to be able to, um, we need to be able uh, to, uh, to have uh, a, a kind of resource that can, that can help our churches fill in certain gaps that we're not going to necessarily have the competence for, even sometimes the vision for, or even the ability um, in a, a local congregation. Let me give you an example uh, in Mission to North America. Mm -hmm. I can give you lots of examples, but one in particular, because this, this um, our, our, our MNA's disaster response ministry was formed at the same time m a was in 1973. Our disaster response ministry helps to mobilize God's people, mobilize congregants in response to natural disasters to help rebuild communities. So they are constantly monitoring the weather in North America, in the United States and Canada in particular. They're saying, what is hurricane season coming? Okay. What are the current haze that are, are, are uh, you know, um, are likely to cause extensive damage, right? They'll go and mobilize at a, find a, a PCA church that will be the base of operations that is maybe an hour or two hours outside of the, the hurricane zone. And it's the center of operations to go in and help rebuild that community bringing volunteers from all over the place. Now, what, what local church has the resources to do that on its own? Yeah. Right. To be the hands and feet of Jesus 
in loving neighbors who have lost everything, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so, so this as a quote unquote parachurch organization mm -hmm. is one that is, that is necessary in this particular way because no one church can do it mm -hmm. by itself, mm -hmm. right? And I can give you other examples. So again, to help the church do what it can't necessarily do as effectively just on its own at a congregational yeah. level. Yeah. Or even lastly, or even to think through things um, with greater depth and wisdom in, um, in a way that you know, individual pastors, elders, congregants um, aren't able to do so. I love yeah. it. Yeah, so it allows, it allows the church to do what the church was told to do by Jesus, proclaim the gospel. And um, other things come around it to help it in that aspect, but they know that they are not the thing that does that because that's not what Jesus commissioned them to do. So they they kind of they help, they help the church do this, but to do the things that the church wasn't necessarily commissioned to do, but can help it along these aspects as well. So there's there's this relationship, and I, I think Nick will ask some of these questions too about how how some of this stuff works as well. Yeah, yeah. That I think when I think of the church, I think of a congregation of people with the main focus to worship God, how we are biblically prescribed by God to do so. Right. So that's what I think of the church, and also to explain to the audience when we say church, sometimes we mean mean big C church. We think the overall Christian worldwide church as we are all together, one family in God's family, covenantal family, where um, I think when you're, a lot of times when you're mentioning the parachurch organization supporting the church, I think sometimes you mean the big C church, right? You mean sometimes, yes. overall, and sometimes more, sometimes directly it's, it's evident that you're serving a specific local congregation which is like more of a little c church like a, a specific church but main focus serving the church big c church um so i guess this question would be we know what a church is we've talked about that a lot this season i mean this season is called the reformed church so we've really drilled into what the church is you go there to worship god how we're prescribed to um you've talked about a little bit of the relationship maybe drilling in more to like the compare and the contrast of a parachurch organization because it is there to serve the church mm -hmm. maybe what are some things that <clears throat> that we could maybe some specific examples of like what we could have the freedom to do in service to the church in a parachurch organization that you necessarily wouldn't really be seeing at a actual church yeah uh, let me let me uh, back up just a second sure, and give a, a, a further emphasis on the church, right? As yeah. body of people, please constituted for the worship of God as God has prescribed, right? Yeah. And I'm sure you've engaged this already, but mm -hmm. right, that's more than just what we do on Sunday morning when we come together for a worship service, right? Right. It describes our life as God's people together, which includes what Jesus says is a great commandment to love God with everything and love our neighbors as ourselves. So, so, so we can't even think about the church apart from the command to neighbor, to love neighbor in Jesus name. Mm -hmm, right. right. So it's right. It doesn't exist solely for itself. It has to have an outward face as well mm -hmm. that is present in a local community um, doing good, <laughs> doing good work, the good work which God prepared in advance for us to walk in, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a part of it uh, as well. And so when you think about parachurch organizations, here's, here's one of the things that they are able to do that, that churches, don't necessarily have the liberty, quote unquote, right. to do. Hmm. A parachurch organization can specialize in one particular aspect of hmm. ministry. I can be 
the parachurch, I just described our disaster response yep. ministry for Mission to North America. We've got several others. We've got engaging disability, which comes alongside and teaches and engages and trains church. How do we love neighbors well? How do we be a church that is welcoming to image bearers who have disabilities, mm -hmm. all kinds of disabilities in every generation across every line of difference? We've got metanoia prison ministry. How do we help serve those and minister to image bearers who are incarcerated with the gospel? We have ministry to state. How, what does it look like for Christians to be present in the halls of, the, of Congress or in the halls of the state capital where laws are being made? How do we bring the gospel to bear and help um, our lawmakers know the Lord, right? No church is rightly going to say, we are a church that focuses exclusively on ministering to, to lawmakers and politicians. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We are a church that focuses exclusively on ministering to uh, those who are incarcerated. Mm -hmm. right, we, so parachurch organizations um, can have a pretty narrow focus. That's why it can do a depth of thought, a depth of, of discernment and best practices, a, a way of connecting people to the and providing resources so that the church that has an interest in this area doesn't have to create it from from scratch right doesn't have to um figure out how do we do this well mm. well we've got a parachurch organization that is that loves the lord and that right loves the church and is serving the church for this particular interest right mm. so again that's the benefit Mm. of a parachurch so 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 almost by definition parachurch organization focuses pretty exclusively on one or a handful of things <laughs> it is not it is not the breadth of the local church or even the capital c church in terms of its ministry work mm. it is now so our so in the pca we have mission to the world, which is our global missions. <laughs> so just like mission to North America is for our domestic missions in the United States and Canada, mission to North to the world is the PCA's global missions arm. Reformed University Fellowship is our campus ministry <laughs> that focuses on ministering to students in college campuses, right? Mm. So, so, right, again, very particular and narrow focus areas that parachurch ministries have the liberty to engage mm -hmm. in service to the church in ways that the church just can't. Again, doesn't have the, the resources and the capacity to do it to that depth. Oh, mm -hmm. I love it. Yeah, that, yeah. that allows, <clears throat> takes the weight off of, or even like you said, doing things that a church um, might even isn't not, isn't able to do so they can just operate as a church which is mm -hmm. you know what you described a church is and so that's that's helpful because a lot of churches um i'm just generally speaking so i'm not calling specific ones out but so there might be churches out there that don't have or don't operate or know of or believe in a parachurch and they try to be a parachurch and a church at the same time yeah, no, that's yeah. yeah, that's really helpful stuff. I mean, a key um, here's a here's a, yeah. you go, a, a key question is this: at a congregational level, right? what does it what does it mean? What does it look like for us to be faithful to the Lord in this particular place, in this particular community where we're gathered, where our people reside? What does it look like to love God and love neighbor well? here right and so that that is always going to include some type of ministry outreach mm -hmm. what are the issues that are having an impact in our community on our neighbors that god desires us to engage for their wealth for the sake of their well-being 
right? And <clears throat> imparts very regularly, helping to discern, even discern that, helping to, um, to, to say, okay, now that we've discerned it, how do we actually do it and mobilize people into this kind of service, right? That's, that's which parachurch organizations can come in hmm. and mm -hmm. ought to come. Yeah, yeah. So we'll, um, we'll kind of dig into some of this too. So um, yeah, I think, I think many people, if they think about parachurch ministry, I'm certain in some sense, most people are, are involved in some sense with parachurch ministry, whether, I mean, reading the resources or listening to, to what they put out or their churches are part of it in some sense. And they may not know like uh, these kind of ins and outs of what they do. Um, so, I mean, you're like, you're in a unique position. You, you've been in parachurch ministries. Um, you, you've led a parachurch ministry um, kind of in the sense with the PCA, though it's still part of the denomination. Um, so how, how can, you've talked about this a little bit, uh, but especially so with um, specifically, how does the church, how does the parachurch come around and support the mission of the church and not be its own entity in and of itself. So let's maybe what is the difference between a parachurch that serves kind of its own purpose and kind of a divorce from the church versus one that serves the church and promotes the mission of the church? Yeah. So um, let me, well, let me say this, right? <clears throat> I don't, And I don't know that a parachurch organization that doesn't serve the interests and mission of the church is a parachurch organization. <laughs> you know? Yeah. If by definition, parachurch means beside the church, coming yeah. alongside the church. Yeah. If you've got no connection mm. to the church and engaging the church, then uh, I don't know that, I mean, you might be a Christian ministry organization, mm -hmm. right? Who is, who has a passion for something mm -hmm. in society, right? But if there's no engagement with the church, mm -hmm. I just personally have a struggle mm -hmm. calling that a parish church. Yeah, maybe to help people define this a little bit better, um, what what does that relationship between the parachurch? So let's say they're not part of the PCA and have the MA um, with their resources, but like maybe Ligonier or some other big sure. ministry who may yeah. know of. So like what what does that relationship look like for the local yeah. church where you do see this relationship? So you've got a couple of there are, there are not a couple. There are multiple ways in which the relationship takes shape. You use Ligonier again. I came into an understanding of Reformed theology through Ligonier Ministries, mm -hmm. right? through the Renewing Your Mind broadcast and listening to R.C. Sproul's preaching and teaching, right? Mm -hmm. Subscribing to Table Talk magazine, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so that is a very clear kind of training, mm -hmm. right? Um, an educational ministry, right? Helping Christians to think well, right? About the scriptures and about their faith, right? Helping Christians to know what they believe, right? Connecting um, the, the, the current <laughs> realities in our culture and society to the the historical things that the that the church has endured right so so the, the training and equipping kind of maybe that's a category mm -hmm. in multiple ways training and equipping right in service to the church and <clears throat> the the best of parachurch ministries have people in leadership who are um, who are committed members of a church who are under authority under authority in the church mm -hmm. right so there so even if uh, here's another one that's that's an, a, an outstanding ministry Chalmers Center uh, that's based in um, 
in Lookout Mountain, Georgia, Chattanooga, Tennessee. It helps think well, right? They produce the book, you know, When Helping Hurts, Diaconal mm -hmm. Ministry, right? When, what does it look like to actually come alongside those who are impoverished and not just in a patriarchal way or not in, just in a way that just gives handouts? How do you, how do you do robust gospel diaconal ministry to the poor, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, right, there, there are thought leaders in that, mm -hmm. right? Um, but their leadership, mentioned their leadership, are professors at Covenant College, right? Are active, they're active members of the church. And so they maintain their connection to the church, right? Uh, another example of how to come alongside, we've got um, a ministry called ESL, English as a Second Language. Mm -hmm. right? When I was pastoring the church that we planted um, in our community, we were praying, we were like, you know, we were praying about ways in which we could better reach our community. We met in a community center and we noticed that, you know, there were a lot of non-English speakers that had, that, that were in this area, yeah. in that area, right? Um, <clears throat> like, well, how can we, how can we get to know these neighbors? How can we best come alongside, serve them? Um, and we found out about ESL through kind of an email um, notification. And, and we went to the training, got some volunteers, started an ESL ministry on Wednesday evenings, end up with, with um, people um, from over 30 different nations in this mm -hmm in this ESL class mm -hmm. and the way we, the way we're, we're trained to do ESL, right? You always have a gospel presentation. You're always looking, you're always not just learning English, but you're learning the Bible mm -hmm. <laughs> as well. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, so this is a comment we wouldn't have if, if it were not for this ESL ministry, we would have had to craft something on our own. Mm -hmm. which we didn't really have the capacity to do within our, within our congregation. So, so those are ways training, tr maybe training and equipping as the primary uh, category when you think about mm -hmm. how, how effective parachurch ministries come alongside the church, <clears throat> training and equipping for faithful gospel ministry. I like it. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's the training and equipping and um, those who lead or those who serve in these parachurch ministries are under authority of the local church. So it's not just um, it's not just saying that we are serving the church, but actually they are serving the church, and this is mm -hmm. this is part of their ministry. And they're they're always driving towards the church, always driving towards um, the gospel message or diaconal ministry or whatever a help or um, translation or yeah training. So that's I think these are these are helpful categories for those um, who know what a parachurch like see, like if they look at ligonier they look at gospel coalition they look at any one of these places and they say oh like i i, I see it i kind of know what it is but i don't really know how it relates to the church it's, i think these are helpful questions and, and answers to to see how this relates and, and let me let me say one thing for clarity mm -hmm. right when i talk about when i say maybe a a an organization that is um not Prior, primarily serving the church for its work and mission mm -hmm. it, 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 as not being a parachurch organization, but maybe being a Christian organization. Mm -hmm. I'm not decrying those. I'm not yeah. saying that that's, oh, yeah. that's not beneficial <laughs> oh, <for sure. laughs> to society, right? Mm -hmm. And that those, that those shouldn't exist. That's not mm -hmm. what I'm saying. I'm just making a distinction between what I perceive yep. as a parachurch ministry or organization and what I perceive as a Christian ministry that might be a beneficial one, but doesn't see its primary work as being in service to the church. Yeah, it might. My, my yeah, I think that's that's really helpful. Yeah, we're not we're not downgrading, but my guess is there's probably not much of an understanding of how those differ is from mm -hmm. Christian ministries to parachurch ministries. And so people probably think you can interchange those terms mm -hmm. versus no one is specifically towards we're training, we're, 
we're moving towards the church, we're, we're supporting the church, which is one tends to be more autonomous, not neglecting the church, but not total, not not aiming for the service of the church. I think, yeah, we're not saying one's better than the other necessarily. Um, but yeah, I think that's helpful. I, I just think people, people when they when they think of any type of ministry, my guess is they they think of all of them relatively the same, um, mm. kind of interchangeable terms. Well, here's a very practical question. Our podcast, for example, our mission is to serve the church. Um, but would you characterize this podcast specifically as technically a parachurch? Or if not, that's okay. I just want to know <laughs> for the audience. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to know for the audience, um, yeah. you know, how, how to characterize that. Yeah, I would say so. I would say so. Now, nice. right, we didn't get to ask the question, how does this podcast serve the church, mm-hmm. right? When you say, oh, yeah, if this is our desire, our heart is to serve the church. Mm-hmm. And we do it in this way, mm-hmm. right? To, to, be able to, to be able to say that. We don't exist just for ourselves to have nice conversations about Christian beliefs, yeah. right? We, we're seeking to serve the church and it's mm. interesting. Okay, yeah. cool. And then when I think of scripture, because we're reformed, we love going back to scripture, right? So I think of, well, Matthew 28 is making disciples of all nations, but even like Romans 12 with his service and training and teaching and 1 Corinthians 12 and Ephesians 4, are those, are those verses that really come alongside and support the idea and creation of parachurches? Or do you have a better maybe biblical example going back to scripture and saying this is why we have parachurches well look um the we we've got historic confessions and creeds Mm -hmm. that particularly as reformed believers we adhere to as faithful representations of what the scriptures teach, right? Mm-hmm. They're not, right? Belgian Confession, Heidelberg Catechism, you know, uh, Westminster, right? These are not, these are not <clears throat> um, the scriptures, mm-hmm. but we, we hold them in very high regard as, as, as these churchmen came together to, to, Right, that's what creeds and confessions do. I always just say, okay, what do we believe, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? In response to what our culture is saying, mm-hmm. right? Or what in response to maybe what some heretical position is claiming, mm-hmm. right? And so even the formation of our creeds and confessions in the church, we say, well, well, these are part, these come out of the Reformation, but wait, is this a single church, right? Is this a single um, denomination? Or, or, did they err, you know, in saying, let's, let's convene the Westminster Assembly, right? Um, and we would say no, right? We would say um, that, that this was right and good and, um, and proper. Right. Um, I mean, we can go down a we can go down a rabbit hole here, <laughs> mm-hmm. and and we can say, okay, well, what about denominations? Mm-hmm. What about the Presbyterian Church in the in America? What about uh, the URC? <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, what about the OPC? Right. What I mean, what about all of these denominations that claim to be the church, not capital C, totality of the church, but legitimate churches, right? Um, you know, do you, well, what gives us the right to make to that claim about ourselves? Well, we would turn to the scriptures, right, and say so. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, 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 so my point is, that in some sense it gets to be a circular argument um if i'm just going to look for um 
a biblical verse or some verses that um, that help me to justify the establishment of parachurch organizations. Um, the the where where we could say the scriptures didn't envision different denominations. Yeah. Right. And we could say maybe the scriptures didn't envision parachurch organizations either. Mm -hmm. Right. However, right, um, where you find people who are willingly and um, and enthusiastically submitting themselves to the authority of scripture in their pursuit, we can say that's where we find the most legitimacy, right? We are willingly submitting ourselves. So, so that's why when I talk about a parachurch organization, it, its priority is the church, not itself. Because it's one thing you can argue and say, mm, there's no question that the scriptures prioritize the church, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And so, and so, what the work that we do needs to be in service to to that organization and organism that Christ has established. Yeah, yeah. yeah maybe before Nick asks his next question, just maybe a quick little comment, kind of a question, but because <clears throat> it's it's more in response to to those who say, well, if it's not in Scripture explicitly, it's not something we can do. Um, and if I can't find a verse or a chapter, like think of covenant theology, whatever it may be, if I can't find a verse that tells me that I can do this, like if Peter and Paul didn't establish a parachurch in the book of Acts and like, man, we can't do it. So it's, it's, it's more, I think it's, it's those who, who look at this. And I think for the most part, people will say, yeah, but parachurch ministry is a good thing. It's, it's kind of a good necessary consequence from scripture and, and helping and training the church. Uh, but I think there are some kind of the, the curmudgeon type who look like, man, if it's not there, then we can't do it. Yes, and again, I would go back to, you know, and this is maybe using it out of context, right? but, uh, <laughs> as the Westminster Confession talks about, you know, all things necessary for our salvation or is it um, expressly written down in mm -hmm. scripture or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced <laughs> mm -hmm. right, from it. And this is more in the in the area of good and necessary consequence. Like, what is it? If it is, there's a reality that says, "Look, okay, is this something that's forbidden by Scripture? Right? Is this something that is against Christ and His priorities and His kingdom? Right? Those are those are legitimate questions." Mm -hmm. right? Is the establishment of an parent church so so did the presbyterian church in america err when it established mission to north america mission to the world reformed university fellowship um even ridge haven our camp right for, for you know for summer camp right um uh covenant college covenant did were we in error when we said, These are, this is wise for us to do so that our church can be better resourced and equipped to do the work that it's been called to do. I would say, no, it didn't occur, right? But the, the establishment of these, of these ministry arms are not commanded by scripture. And I would say, right, scripture's silent on, <laughs> on mm -hmm. this, right? But the spirit does give us wisdom and discernment, mm -hmm. right? And so we walk forward with them it, in that wisdom and discernment. And we, and we know that those things are not the church. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's, that's good. Yeah, Paul, was, <clears throat> Paul studied under the feet of Gamaliel, obviously before he was called by Christ, but he pulled on that education and probably, I mean, every indication is he had the entire Old Testament memorized, at least in Greek, if not in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. And he pulls on this when he writes the epistle. So it's, it's, um, I think it's, yeah, it's instructive where, um, yes, scripture is silent. It says nothing about it explicitly, 
Um, but it sure is not silent on the church. And if we want, if we want the church to be built up, then I think we're instructed in, in some sense to do some of these things. Well, look, okay, let's just say this, right? Is the establishment of the synagogue prescribed in scripture? Right? Do we do we go and say, find chapter and verse? Yep. Where the Lord says, here's how you do gatherings once you return from exile. Um, you know, and this is what the service looks like. Mm -hmm. Right? But where does Jesus go when he launches his ministry? Goes to the synagogues. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. I mean, so again. Sorry, I don't want to, yeah, no, totally. No, this is great. And it seems like to me, <clears throat> this is a natural, parachurches are a natural response us Christians have to serving the church, like you said, and, and, and working out guilt, grace, gratitude, the gratitude part. It's mm -hmm. a natural response to us in God's family that are working out our gratitude, our sanctification, and and s coming alongside and helping our church out. It just seems like a natural organic response to scripture that's right. based me, on gratitude. That's right. That's exactly right. Let me let me add one more. Let me Please. Right there is in the past couple of decades, there's been an explosive growth in faith and work or ministry organizations. Faith and which 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 are um, maybe the mostly popularized through Redeemer in New York City, mm -hmm. right? But which says God wants his people to be faithful to him in every sphere, right? I mean, it's, it's not new, right? It's that Kuiper, right? right? Oh. There's no mm -hmm. square inch mm -hmm. of which Christ doesn't say mine, right? Right. Um, or, or even when we find in Calvin talking about our vocation as callings, mm -hmm. right? Well, how are Christians equipped to see not just their vocational life as a calling from God, as a legitimate calling from God to be faithfully present in their work, doing work for Christ and his kingdom? And what does that look like in your various vocational pursuit? Mm -hmm. Well, how many pastors are equipped to do that kind of discipleship for their people? Yeah, not many. Right? So it makes sense. Can we find people who have thought well on this, who are maybe even former industry leaders, who mm -hmm. are Christians, who can help come alongside and who can be trusted resources to help us do kind of the vocational discipleship piece yeah. for our people to see whatever vocation they're called they're called into as a calling from God for faithfulness hmm. right I mean again that's beneficial that's that's wise as a pastor I'm not going to have the time to be able to <laughs> to do that yep mm, that's yeah. good that's good and maybe the most important question here. So, um, is it about kettlebells? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, how many can most, you do? How many, how many can yeah. you do on broken? Um, no, uh, <clears throat> as far as wrapping all this up into the most important focus, which is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. like, how can the church and parachurch ministries, um, your advice, better? partner together for the advance of the gospel of Jesus. Um, <clears throat> I, and I like the way you, you frame that because this really is about, as I, the terminology I use for Mission to North America is cultivating kingdom advancement, right? To, to help, it's the church, right? That Jesus works through to advance his kingdom purposes mm -hmm. Uh, and an agenda, and parrot and these ministries and organizations come alongside to help cultivate that. So I would say the the a, a few things. I would say one to not see this to to have a a healthy view that's that that churches 
church capital C and congregations little c really do see the value and the wisdom behind the establishment of of parachurch organizations that that can help them in their ministry and missional pursuits right? and that that parachurch organizations remind themselves on a regular repeated basis that they exist for the service to serve the church mm -hmm. they don't exist for their own benefit right and um and a and a a deepening sense of appreciation for one another it just you know the reason why humility is a fruit of the spirit mm -hmm. right that that this because because what often happens is a sense of arrogance i go in a pair like not often I, I i'm overstating but what can happen is a sense mm -hmm. of arrogance mm -hmm. on a parachurch side it says we know better than mm -hmm. the church <laughs> mm -hmm. no we're in humble service to the church mm -hmm. or even a an, an arrogance from the church side that says we don't need mm -hmm. any outside help or influence we have everything we need here mm -hmm. right i said well wait a second you know wh why would you think that you can't use that the lord can't provide wisdom from outside of your congregation to help you right mm -hmm. um and so i think a a deepening sense of apparent of appreciation and uh a, a and a humility in approach yeah, and yeah. <clears throat> before peter jumps in real quick because i i know church leaders are listening to this episode and they're like this is great uh where do i find a prayer church how do i find <laughs> one do i just go on google and type in prayer church and then people <laughs> People, just everyday Christians and lay people are like, um, how do I join a parachurch? What, what do I do? How do I even know where to look? So could you give some practical advice um, to both sides, the church and people, mm -hmm. how to find a parachurch? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that on the church side, you know, um, the, the questions around I, that I posed earlier, what does faithfulness to Christ look like for us in this community and context? Mm -hmm. What are the animating issues in our community that need a gospel response, right? Whether that be issues around poverty, issues around justice, racial unrest, <laughs> issues, um, again, around um, responding to natural disaster, whatever, what are the animating concerns here that, that we are being moved by God to provide a gospel response to, right? And so it's not just kind of picking off the top, right? Um, and, and that and the discipleship question, how do we best disciple our people into faithfulness, right? Those are things that you start to wrestle with and have conversation about and say, oh, discern here then are our needs. And then I can look, mm -hmm. we can look for a parachurch organization to maybe help us with some training and equipping or engagement, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's what happened a lot with our Institute for Cross-Cultural Mission. Mm -hmm. Churches are answering, you know, after the, all of the racial unrest and protests, in summer of 2020, Pastor, what do we do? How do we respond in a biblically faithful way? Hmm. And that's what our organization existed for, <laughs> right? Um, and so as, as far as individual Christians, it can come down to what are the things that I'm personally passionate about? What are the things that I'm personally um, desire to see? the Lord change uh, or to see Christians in the church engage? And are there organizations that are committed to this kind of work? 
right? And, and I can explore that. You know, many of our, I'll, you know, leave this as a last example, our, our engaging disabilities ministry was led by Ashley Belknap, right? Her leading this ministry comes out of her own story, mm -hmm. right? Of raising uh, a child with um, developmental challenges mm -hmm. and not being able to find a place in the church. Right, with a with a child who right can't necessarily control themselves and always kind of loud and you know right. Mm -hmm. So so what do we do? And 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 right, there probably isn't a person, right, a family, a congregation that doesn't have to some connection with someone that is dealing with the challenge of disability in some way, shape, or form. Right. And so, so very often our passions ministry wise come out of our personal stories. And we can say, has anyone else been doing this kind of work? I mean, you find the kinds of uh, parachurch organizations that are, that are dealing with issues of human trafficking, mm -hmm. right? Various those passions come out of people's own personal stories, you know? So I would say, right, that, that discernment from what are my sense of passion uh, here and, and are there organizations that are, that, that share in that, that I can serve with? Hmm. Yeah, that's really helpful. Yeah, that's, that's that, that helps me too because we'll, we'll be planting a church. At, when we record, this is June 2nd, we're recording this. Um, we're publishing this in July, but mm -hmm. yeah, next next Sunday is when we we have so not this right. Sunday, but next Sunday we have our first our first service in San Diego. So it's there there are questions that I need to be thinking about. I think other I yes. think other church leaders would do well to think about these things right. to think about who are the people, and that requires you to know your people well. That requires you to know your community well, um, right. the history of your community, what they've been dealing with. Because <clears throat> if we just insert a church somewhere. Um, right without any knowledge of some of this stuff, it, it, we can we can tend to alienate those who we shouldn't be alienating um, yes. in this sure. within this congregation. So it's yeah, it's these are really, really helpful questions, I think, to um, drive us towards, yeah, the church has a specific task to preach the gospel um, to the, her people in her context, um, using language that they understand and using um, w w metaphors, w whatever it be and in, in helping them where they're at. And we can do this better with the help of the local church or with the local kind of parachurch ministries and, and global parachurch ministries. Um, so yeah, as we as we end this out, I think it's it's been a really helpful conversation on on parachurch ministries, how they help, um, what their difference is, but also they're not divorced from the church. They they help and train the church. Um, so if if there if people are listening to you for the first time, the second time they've been listening to you, they followed your stuff. Um, let 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 our listeners know where they can find you your work, your ministry, and some of the things you might be up to. So your schedule, some of this course you're sure. teaching, all that stuff. Yes, I mean, a um, couple of ways, you know, for the ministry work that I do for Mission to North America, it's, um, <coughs> it's what is my website? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's erwinins.com. Erwinins.com is my personal website, but the m &A website, I think it's uh, pcamna.org. Okay. Uh, I believe is the uh, is the ministry. It is. Yep. Website, and you can yep. find contact information there. You can also find my contact information on my personal website. Um, you know, I've got Instagram and Facebook and Twitter handles. You want more of those kettlebell um, videos? You got to Instagram. Yeah, that's right. That's at Pastor Irwin is on Instagram. Yep. But the best way to reach me is not DM. <laughs> <laughs> if you DM me, I'm going to forward you to um you know email <laughs> and so um and so but that contact information you can find on the pca mna.org website cool yeah we'll, we'll post some of this stuff on the show notes so people can find out how to how to contact you and some of the work and uh, i know you're teaching adjunct so as the time this comes out you'll be an adjunct professor um at rts so congratulations on that um, but now, yeah, you're doing a lot of other stuff. So, and then you have PCA, by the time this comes out again, the PCA general assembly will have already have happened. 
So I hope that goes well. Oh, Lord, yeah, Lord willing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, Lord willing. Yeah, election yeah. will hope, go well. <laughs> yeah, I hope that goes well. But yeah, um, thanks, thanks for coming on again. Thanks for talking about this. I know this is one of your passions. Uh, and how can we how can we extend the gospel of Jesus? How can we come around the church to help the gospel go out? So yeah, thanks for coming on, and and hopefully we can have you on again in the future. Yeah, I love love hanging with you guys and 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 talking church and ministry. It's always a good time. Cool. All right. Thank you. So we will much. we will see you later.